My wife was snoring gently in our bedroom, like mother, like son. Even now the sound made me smile. Why she'd selected me to spend her life with was mystifying. She was smart, funny and beautiful and could have done so much better for herself. It was so tempting to wake her up. We discussed everything. I loved talking to her. Problem was, I knew how the conversation would go and I just couldn't face it. She wasn't going to be able to conjure up some magical cure for my inevitable fate. She also wasn't going to be able to process the concept of murder-suicide being the best option. Human nature would overcome logic and we'd end up going round and round in circles until it was too late. The only gift that my damnation had given me was clarity and it wasn't something I could share. I didn't have time to argue the point. Not daring to even look at her, I came back down the stairs, just over half an hour remaining. My legs were starting to feel stiff and I had shooting pains running up and down my spine. A strong taste of salt filled my mouth. At this rate, I could have less time than I previously thought. My mood deteriorated as I set to work. While I hauled a barrel of heating oil into the front room, I was thinking about all the books that I could never read. I had shelves of them, waiting for me to find the time to indulge. As I dragged boxes of ammunition out of the cellar, I cursed my own lack of religious faith. Any childhood notion of there being a heaven had left me as the world turned into a living hell. It would have been nice to imagine that I was sending my family to a better place. Still, there was no time for pleasantry or fantasizing. I was about to begin pouring the oil over the living room when a small voice interrupted me. Daddy, what are you doing? Fourteen stories of terror, dread and fatherhood. From the isolation of space to the ever watchful eyes in a darkening wood. Andrew Freudenberg takes us on a journey exploring the themes of friendship, fatherhood and loss as we pick through the remains of his dead and blackened heart. My Dead and Blackened Heart was written by Andrew Freudenberg and published by the Sinister Horror Company in 2019. In this episode of Sinister Reread, Justin Park chats with Andrew about one of the publisher's more eclectic collections. Hello, this is Justin from the Sinister Horror Company, and I'm here today to talk with Andrew Freudenberg, author of the short story collection, My Dead and Blackened Heart. Uh, Andy, or the Freud as you're known, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. Yeah, you know, as good as one can be in these plague-ridden times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So, Andy, so we're here today to talk about your short story collection, My Dead and Blackened Heart. And I believe I'm right in saying that this is your debut collection, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, had quite a few bits and pieces in different uh anthologies obviously besides those of other writers but this is my first solo effort so your first so it's your first solo collection and your first solo book yeah yeah that's right yeah the first question i always like to ask uh authors when i when i'm chatting to them on on uh the podcast is uh quite a basic question to start with really um and that is kind of like like why did you write the book so i want to go back even further than that to start with really and why did you start writing short stories um i i always wrote when i was a kid uh i used to enjoy writing short stories um at school and so on and then i wrote various bits and bobs to myself but i only really did it for for fun uh, and I got involved in music and various other things that distracted me from writing for quite a long time. And then um, I'm not sure, somehow I discovered there was this community of writers of, 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 uh, that weren't necessarily uh, the kind you see on the shelves in WH Smith. And um, a friend of mine was doing um, a charity anthology for... Uh, for the tsunami in Japan, actually. He was an American guy living in Japan. And I'd written a couple of 
weirdly a couple of tweet stories where they were you had to be done in 101 characters or less uh and when he started doing this anthology with quite a few decent people in it i i blagged in basically i said well what about if i wrote something and he said okay go ahead so i did and then uh, through that uh, i met various other authors including uh, one who had his own publishing company and was doing an anthology and i thought i could have a go at that so i did and the uh, story got accepted uh, a bit less automatically than the, the tsunami one uh, and then i just kept going really and and to start with was that was that horror to begin with or was it a different type of genre um you know that was it was actually horror i mean the, the, the tsunami thing was dark uh with a bit, it was a bit of sci, sci-fi horror really um it was only um a thousand words um but yeah i mean it it, it was rough in the in the horror area i would say and the, the anthology that uh was actually uh david norton shires was doing with uh, a press called night watch that's not around anymore was um was a horror anthology yeah and so once you got that and you got a story kind of published in there that just kind of set the ball rolling did it you got the the taste and the enthusiasm for it yeah, that's right. I just thought I just in, enjoyed uh, writing the stories and uh, enjoyed seeing them in print and uh, seemed to get decent reaction to them. So carried on. And so, so that was how you then started to build up this kind of collection of short stories. You were writing stories, submitting them into anthologies, uh, some getting published. So, so how did then the idea of coming to uh, write the collection to, to you know to find the, the ones that you wanted to to create my dead in black and heart um well i guess at, at the back of my mind i was kind of felt like it would be the natural thing to do uh, and a nice thing to do to have my own collection of stories um and uh sinister expressed an interest which gave me the kick i needed to to start thinking about it a bit more seriously um uh, and there was a, a big pile of stories there, obviously. Uh, so I, I just started piling through the ones that I had and, and wrote a few more as well. Uh, and that, that's it, really. And that's, and that's how the book came about. So you've already talked about um, <clears throat> the fact that, like, the first thing you did was kind of sort of sci-fi horror. And I'm right in saying, you know, I know you personally, I know you pretty well. Um, so, you know, I know that um, some of your interest isn't just inside horror. You know, you, you, you do re read widely and in the genre space, you do read in both sci-fi and fantasy and crime as well as just the horror itself, um, which I think kind of sort of seeps into your writing, even in My Dead and Black and Heart, you can see elements of all of those things kind of, you know, see seeping into the stories. So kind of with that in mind, I'm just wondering with such a, a, a wide sort of taste, uh, where where do you get your inspirations from? Uh, <laughs> that's always a really difficult question because I think they come from, I mean, in general, I think they have always thought that they appear from some slightly mysterious place where all these different influences uh, meet together, um, which is, I know, a bit vague. But the story ideas tend tend to appear. I mean, sometimes there's a spark, uh, and might just be that that I had a theme in mind, or that someone suggested a theme to me. Um, my there's a story, something akin to despair in the collection that actually came from a picture uh, of a <laughs> of a shiny silver man looking at the sky, and the story just sort of appeared in my head. Um, some of the others are more inspired by well, it, it, places can be quite inspirational. There's a couple of stories in the anthology that, in my mind, are, are set in very real, definite places. That there's there's probably more in my in my mind than there is in the page sometimes with the, with those settings because I can see where it's all going on. Uh, so I guess that's that's kind of an inspiration too. Um, but I don't, I don't have one specific way of, <laughs> of making stories appear i wish i did 
So when you say uh, places, is that like real life places you visited or places you're making up in your mind? Um, uh, I, well, I was thinking of places, real life places that I visited. I mean, Charlie's Turn is a story that's two boys uh, in the countryside. And I grew up on an, actually grew up on an apple orchard in, in Somerset. Um, so I had a very specific picture in my in my mind of, of where they were and and things like them emerging from the trees I w was definitely based on childhood memory rather than something I made up but then going to the other extreme uh, there's a story called the cardiac ordeal which is set in London and again the flat that the people live in is a flat that I've been to and the area that that they they're walking around is somewhere I've actually I actually lived so yeah real places in those cases and in some other places it's a bit more generic there's a few set in london that could be anywhere in london i suppose uh but with a hopefully a, a sort of realistic feel of london as i know it uh and then there's obviously a few stories that are set in uh places i haven't been but yeah i think i think it certainly place tends to be based on places i've actually been so you're using so with the, like with something akin to despair that was a piece of art which triggered it so you have kind of art like that these images and then other bits where you're talking about the place so it's it's that that <clears throat> wide range of experience that you've had in life you know you, you've traveled a lot you've done quite a lot in your life so you're able to draw on all those experiences when you're searching for inspiration yeah i think so i hope so um i think it, that that sort of thing has to come has to come from somewhere and I guess it's a bit more uh, convincing if you actually have experienced uh, some of those things and some of those places I mean even you know well I, like you say I've, I've traveled quite a bit so if I need to put someone in a desert or I need to put someone in in Australia or in Asia I've, I've been to those places uh, and I've been in odd situations that might lend themselves to <laughs> to a story i mean there's still quite a lot to mine on that front i'd say <laughs> so, so so that's where you're picking up some of the influences in your inspiration from when you uh when you sit down to to write a story uh you know when those ideas actually pop into your head is it because you've got a theme you come up with a theme and then you start drawing on those influences to look for it and that's like a very um conscious process or is it ideas just kind of drift into your head and then you've got to capture and write them down um it, it's it's a mixture of things i mean that certainly sometimes a theme can be enough to trigger an idea which <laughs> may have been lurking in there in the first place i mean i really saw a couple of the stories in there i I had no more, you know, a theme like a farmyard, a farm theme. And then suddenly this whole thing grew out of that. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking of some of the stories are like that. And then I think of another, a story like uh, the one I mentioned earlier, the cardiac ordeal, which definitely had, you know, the place is real. So there is that. But God knows where the idea of the story actually came from. <laughs> What would you say, and thinking about <clears throat> the stories in My Dead and Blackened Heart, what would you say were your biggest influences in the book? Were there any particular uh, authors or styles of writing or films or, or music or anything else that had direct influences on those stories? Um, I, I, I mean, I, as I sort of, I guess, repeatedly say, everything seems to merge into into the into influence from a variety of, of disparate sources so I, I, it's really hard to you know i think horror sci-fi heavy metal and interest in history traveling they all kind of they merge together and i don't know that there's uh sometimes i might catch a, a sort of a whiff of where the influence has come from while i'm writing it um but it doesn't you know, I know some writers would say, oh, well, I, it's all about Lovecraft or, or all about King, but I, I don't tend to try and be like those people. I think that's part, you know, part of the part It's probably part of my problem in terms of uh, focus and part of my benefit in, in sort of doing a variety of things. Um, I th I, yeah, I, I think uh, the um, Charlie's turn that I mentioned before, 
I'd say that's a little bit Saki influence, but I don't think it's on purpose. I think it's just because I like Saki, and as I was writing it, I, I, I thought well, it's a little bit like him. I mean, I'd never claim to be on his level, but <laughs> yeah. So you couldn't necessarily pinpoint like particular writers or styles that have have influenced you directly. Well, I, just a lot of lot of bits all pushed together. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, when I was a, a kid, um, Herbert and, and Stephen King were kind of going strong. So I guess I read a lot of the early Stephen King books and I read The Rats and The Fog and all those things, which I think a lot of people of my age did when they, I think a lot of schools in England were struck by the rats and copies would be passed around. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I liked, uh, I like so many different different things. I like Lovecraft and Poe for their kind of classic edge, and I like um, you know more modern extreme authors as well. Uh, I sometimes I think watching Doctor Who when you're at three or four is quite a good sort of primer for horror. Because you do read a lot and are, and are widely read, do you find that uh, the things that you are reading at that time influence what you're writing? Um, I, I'm not really conscious of it, but I think they probably do to a certain extent. Um, and the problem is, I've, I could be reading, you know, I could be reading Dickens or Gormenghast one minute, and uh, a sort of flesh-eating anthology the next, and, and Batman <laughs> the next. So it's a bit of a bumpy ride as far as influences is concerned. Um, I, but yeah, I think, I think. I mean, I certainly read things and think I like the feel of this, but whether I actually deliberately, you know, do one thing in that style or that feel, I don't know. I don't think so. The other thing I really fascinated with to find out is uh, how you actually write your stories. So, like, you, you come up with an idea. So, do you just sit down and, and, and just bash out an idea straight from start to finish? Do you have like a, a thought in mind of where it's going to end or do you not know? How, how do you actually write a short story? Um, I think all of the above, actually. Um, some of my stories, I've sat down and the ideas come to me and I've bashed it out in, in, in one sitting. Yeah, uh, is there any, any in My Dead and Black and Heart where you remember doing that? Um, particularly the, the, the two that kind of send most people screaming for the hills um and milkshake and meat streets were both absolutely roared out of my my brain and then the most sort of pulpy disgusting stories in the collection um but they were just so uh i don't know they just, they just appeared on the page really to be honest with you um but other, some other stories um have been far more torturous to, to make happen i mean there's one or two where i've sort of written the whole thing and then I've, I've killed the entire second half because I didn't like it um, for the good of the story I think in the end but um, I I do you know I sort of plan I do plan some and then some I have no idea what I'm doing um, and when you say but, you plan is that is that like a plan in your head or do you actually write down say notes of like story beats of how it's going <laughs> um I, occasionally, I, I might scribble something down, but it tends to be in my head, if I'm totally honest. Okay. I mean, I write plan. I do write some plans down. They're not always the stories that get written in the end. You, what you find as in you when you start writing it, it deviates in a different direction, or you write it with the plan, don't like it, and then scrub half of it out and rewrite. Um, a, a little bit of that, or uh, or I write a plan and then. Uh, something shinier comes along and I write that instead and just make it up in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a terrible one for starting things. Uh, and, and I have many opening paragraphs and opening pages, thousands and thousands of words of stuff that, that, you know, I need to get back to. <laughs> Unfinished uh, stories. Yeah, loads of it. You talked about some stories that are a bit more torturous to write. Is there any in uh, the collection? which you can sort of pinpoint that were kind of a bit more difficult? Hope Eternal, I think, was, was quite a difficult one. It started out really well. I really liked the feel of, of, of where it was going uh, and the atmosphere and so on. Um, 
I had a general idea of, of what was going to happen, but it, that was that's the one actually that I mentioned before that I had an ending and had to get rid of it because it was just terrible. What was the ending? Um, you can talk. You can talk spoilers here. <laughs> well, it, um, yeah, he he um, in in the sort of finished version, he's looking. Well, in the story is basically he's looking for his daughter, uh, and he's. There's a sort, there's sort of hints of 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 how it how it went. I'm I'm trying to think exactly how it was. It because there's a sort of a, a small theme in the city of people being just victims of of cities, and that it's actually cities rather than individuals that that go to war. It's all set during the Second World War, uh, and I think there was an element of of uh, the character gets hit by a by a sort of the, almost gets hit by a bomb and gets knocked out and I think in the original version he uh, <laughs> I think he travelled in time and kind of met people from other eras of London and possibly met a person who actually was, it was just wasn't good it was um, yeah I can't specifically think how it ended I'm not sure it actually got to an end of a sort of a huge chunk and I was sort of getting bogged down by this uh, personification of London and and I don't know, Roman soldiers appearing or something, and yeah, I had to kill it. <laughs> when you say you killed it, you, you did you get rid of it, and then the ending was kind of th there at the bit where you chopped it off, or did you kill a load of it and then write a new ending? Um, I kill. I just yeah, I just sort of deleted the last fifty percent <laughs> and thought, where should this be going? Because this isn't right. And so, where you cut it off to was just how the story ended. It was like a neat ending point. Oh no 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 not at all no I, I mean I I I, re, I pretty much cut it off to the point at which he's um, out in an air raid looking for his lost daughter um, and gets involved or gets caught by this uh, exploding bomb. Uh, I sort of cut it I cut it off there and then started again. When you write a story. And, and you get to the end of it. Do you go back and revise it more? Uh, like how many drafts do you, do you normally sort of do? And do you share it with other people as well? Um, I do sometimes share it with people. Um, I'm not, I don't, I, I'm not a big doer of that. I mean, I don't sort of deliberately think I must now send, it's not part of my routine that, you know, I must send this story out to the beta reader or the editor or whatever now. Um, I go back and polish it and polish it. Uh, I don't tend to change all that much necessarily, uh, apart from obviously hacking off the last half and putting it in the bin. But um, I, I'm a terrible one for editing as I go along, which is really slows me down and I keep trying not to do it. Um, but yeah, no, generally uh, I don't change all that much but I do a lot of, a lot of sort of tightening up and tidying and if my editor should say make it more horrible than I do that. <laughs> <laughs> and how long would you say uh, on average it takes to write a short story? I mean thinking of the stories in my dead and black and heart we're talking what their their average length of about sort of four or five thousand words roughly aren't they? Yeah. So it's how uh, long do you think they would take? I think there'd be a huge variety, you know, I think that possibly at first draft of Meat Sweets might have taken a day um, or, you know, or, or even not half, I really can't remember, but probably not not so long uh, and something like uh, Scorch or, or um, Hope Eternal yeah. um, would take a number of days. I mean, I'm quite a bitty writer, so I might do a few hours and then, you know, come back to it days later. If it hasn't, if it doesn't flow immediately, and then I get annoyed with it and kind of go away and do something else and come back to it. So it's quite hard to put a, a time on it. Yeah, quite a, too long. <laughs> and there's, too long. and that's interesting. The way you say, you know, you're quite a bitty writer. You might get annoyed with it, go away and do other stuff. Do you write more than one story at a time? You've got a couple on the go, or is it always focus on one story until you uh, it or abandon it? Uh, um, just, I've got, like, as I was mentioning, all these bits and pieces that I've got, 
you know, like I say, they range from one sentence to a few thousand words. I've got dozens of them. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean they'll necessarily all be finished either. I mean, it, you know, go back to the ones that I think are worth it. Um, so I guess the short answer to that is um, I work on loads of them at the same time. But sometimes if, I, if, if it flows well enough and I'm concentrating, then I just work on that particular one. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, if I've got a deadline and I, you know, I really want to get this story, a story done, then I'll concentrate on that one story. Um, but a lot of the time, I'm flitting around like the unfocused bee that I am. So the motivation of a deadline kind of cracks the whip and then sometimes forces your hand to finish the story. Yeah, that certainly helps. So one of the key things about my dead and black and heart, which which. Um, I found very interesting when I was first reading it was um, the stories of uh, they're fairy. They're really varied. I mean, we talked about your influences already. We start off on like a kind of a sci-fi style thing, which then immediately goes into like a folk. The next story is like folk horror. Uh, and then, you know, within that we've got, uh, and then I think the next one is goes into, uh, yeah, in, in, into the war before we're into a zombie apocalypse. So you know, they kind of range all over the place. But what's really interesting, I thought, was that there was a thread. There was a thread of common themes that was running through this. And I don't want to say what those themes are. I, I wondered what, what you thought about that. And you thought, what were the themes and the messages that you were personally sort of going through and, and exploring within this collection? Well, um, I, I think I should say that, I, that the themes that have, that there are in there have, have tended to be more of an emergent thing than a deliberate thing. I mean, it really, when I went back and looked at all the stories that I'd written over the last, well, I don't know, decade and a bit, uh, decade and a half, I don't know. Um, there was definitely a the there were definitely themes there that I hadn't really realized were, were, were coming out because I, I'm a big believer in the, in, in, in theme kind of coming out from the story fairly fairly naturally um but uh so the themes that i thought were appearing were basically um parenthood um loss and and i guess this <laughs> i was thinking about it today hopelessness to a certain extent but certainly uh, there's quite a few stories involving children i mean not usually pretty indirectly it's probably more about the parents than it is about the children, with a couple of exceptions. Um, but yeah, and, and it coincides with me becoming a, a parent of, of three kids myself, my sort of getting back into writing. So there's a fairly ob obvious link there, I suppose. The horrors of parenthood. <laughs> well, the horrors of parenthood, or, or it's the opposite almost as well, isn't it? It's the horrors of something happening to your your children that loss theme that kind yeah, of it's the, it? it's the i guess when you're thinking about writing something that is a, a horror a horrible thing i mean you can either go down the the sort of uh, i suppose you might i don't you almost call it a fantasy route of of sort of monsters and and ghouls and so on or you can think which are, which i have no problem with um, or you can think, what is the most horrible thing that could happen? Um, and to a certain extent, for I think for any parent, that would involve, you know, losing a child or their child being put in a difficult situation, or you being put in a difficult situation where you you uh, you have to uh, make a tough decision. I mean, it's not. It's not, that book is not about. You know, it's not specifically. The collection is not specifically about that. But that's definitely a, a theme that runs through it. I would say. Yeah, yeah. Like you say, it's an emergent theme that has come out from your own your own muse, effectively, isn't it? From from what you're creating from there. That's and, right, and that's yeah. and, and that's interesting. I mean, that's one of the things that I was kind of. Uh, that I really, really got out of the book was that whole that whole parenthood thing and that 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 loss and that difficult situation with the children, and I and I I wonder like, is there anything you have you come across many of those 
uh, that theme in any other stuff that you've read before in the past? I mean, it's not something I personally have seen a lot of, I have to say. No, I don't think I have really. Not not a lot. Um, I can't think of specific examples really. I mean, it must pop up from place to place, but uh, no, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm sure it's not totally unique, but it's not something that I've seen a lot of elsewhere, no. So you talked about the themes, talked about the contents inside the book. Um, one of the things I really want to talk about is also the cover design and the cover itself, because it's it's very striking. I mean, it's white. Normally, most books, horror books, are kind of black and red. It's kind of a theme. But a strike, a white book is very kind of striking. And, and this image on the front is this, this really kind of creepy image of this, you know, just drawn. <laughs> I mean. Can you tell me about this cover, where it came about, how it happened? Yeah, um, well, I guess, I don't know, is it ironic? Uh, being <laughs> being that we were just talking about the theme of, of, of children and their influences, it's actually a picture that my youngest son, Xavier, drew um, as a self-portrait at school uh, when he was f quite possibly four or five. Um, they were just told to draw themselves and he drew this picture in charcoal um and brought it home <laughs> and we kind of went oh that's interesting <laughs> i mean he's a very you know he's a very creative kid uh and he does have a bit of a sort of gothic sensibility but i think it was uh, just one of those strange things where where lightning strikes and and he just created this image that as you say it's, it's strike it's a striking thing uh, and I just thought that would make an amazing picture uh, for the cover of a book and he did uh, we used uh, and it, one of his pictures as a sort of interior next to the um, starts of the story as well which is just a strange skeleton that he did he had a definitely had a bit of a touch at one point for coming up with uh, something that seemed to have a horror sensibility it's fantastic I mean it's so expressive isn't it with all the all the fingerprints and the pushing around it be a hard thing to plan I think you know unless you I mean if you had an artist in mind that always worked that way then I guess you could say do something like this um but yeah it's a it's a bit of a, a bit of a one-off I think uh, and uh, I mean obviously I know the story because I was I was part of uh, the creative process <clears throat> in designing the actual look of the book as well but do you want to talk about the uh, how we eventually got to, to this cover? Um, well, we had a few ideas, didn't we? Um, that were, uh, we had a couple that were sort of directly related to the title, I suppose, with, with hearts and heart readings and so on. Um, I think there was uh, an owl involved at one point. <laughs> I know we tried a few things and they, you know, they were all okay. Um, but uh, this one seemed to stand out. I, I think this one just seemed like the right thing to do. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, if I, my memory is correct on this, actually, you first put this cover over and said, I think this should be the cover. And I think at the time I went, what are you kidding me? Really? <laughs> And then we went off and we we looked at all these other different things. You you did a couple of designs, I did a couple of designs, and none of it really worked, did it? And it was only at the point where I think I was, I just pulled the image back up again and started to play with it because um, you had an image on your wall we were going to use at one point. Yeah, that's right. Well, I've got a, a, a painting by Daniel Serres. You know, anybody who reads uh, enough horror will have come across his his fantastic sort of ink and pen largely drawings uh, and when I bought it off him I made sure to say Daniel could I possibly use it for a, Danny could I use it for a cover sometime please and he sort of went uh, okay <laughs> so I have that sort of in, in the bank and it is a fantastic picture um, but it didn't seem quite right, uh, yeah, and, that's right. And, and I was playing with that image and then we brought the 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 image that is cover now back up and just looked at it and went no, no this is it this is right so you yeah. were right all along and the, the, <laughs> <I> <laughs> <to you. laughs> 
Yeah, no, no, and the, I mean, I think we you you managed to, um, I think with both images, getting uh, the text to sit right with them because they're both um, so vivid. I don't know if that's the right word, but they're difficult. They were difficult to put a to put text with, and I think you managed to nail the, uh, the the text within the body with that with that peculiar font, and that yeah. that really worked. It, it it suits it, doesn't it? It does make it for a striking image. Definitely. Okay, right. So we've gone through the outside of the book. I want to delve back into the book. Really interesting when I when I talk to people about short story collections. And with this one, you say, you know, you've been you you said you've been writing short stories for fifteen years, and you delve back into the collection uh, into all those short stories. Go right. What's going to go in my collection? So, how did you decide? which stories to include in the collection from this wealth of bank of stories that you've got? Um, well, I think initially uh, it was really just the, uh, initially it was about quality. I and mean, I think we sort of, I probably removed uh, a good fistful. That I just thought, no, you know what? I don't really, I, I, I don't think either that they're uh, as good as the other ones or they're not really, uh, horror enough possibly um and from there uh well i think we we i mean we collaborated a bit didn't we on on what what sat well together and what didn't um and there's a, sort of some there's a, some difference between the paperback and the hardback version where there are three i think extra stories in the hardback that could have been you know in the collection but didn't but kind of sit better as a, as a, as an extra perhaps than as as part of the main body of the book. Um, they just were the stories that seemed to 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 go well together and to illustrate um, a variety because it could have it could have gone down a, a sort of undead theme perhaps or a, a wartime theme or you know being much more focused and thematic, um, but wanted to show a variety of, of of styles and tones so i think we picked and choose on that on that basis yeah so you had this bank of, of stories so, so you whittled them down to a sort of view and then and then you pass them up so you pass them to me to have a look at was there other people that you used as well to get their opinion um there are some stories that um friends had had seen before uh i passed them to uh to Tracy Fahey, who's my friend and yours, um, to have a look at a couple of them um, and got quite different reactions, actually. I mean, it, some she was very positive about and a couple of them she was a bit like, you know, oh, I don't know, but I, I won't do an Irish accent, Tracy, you'd be pleased to, to know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know that I'm feeling this as I suppose the basic message. I'm not so sure about those, um, which gave me food for thought, uh, uh, but which I then <laughs> ignored and put them in anyway. <laughs> but they were the more, I mean, I, I think that's one of the things about this book is it, it you know, it, it is more likely that uh, you'll really like 85% than, than, and, and quite like 15% because of the of the uh, of the variety and i think that's i, li I like that you know that it means that that some of those stories will really uh strike a chord with you i mean maybe you'll, you'll, you know all of them will strike a chord with you but it does does um have quite a range yeah and there was i mean i remember when we went through it there was uh so you've already mentioned two of the stories in there milkshake and meat sweets which effectively are um they're follow-on aren't they it's set in the same universe and one is kind of a kind of a sequel to the yeah meat, that's right kind yeah. Of a sequel to, to milkshake um and i think if i remember it correctly you were gonna put meat sweets in but not milkshake is that right um, I, well, if anything's possible, I, I don't, I can't imagine having milkshake, I mean, meat sweets without milkshake in a way, because milkshake is, is the setup for the characters. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're both, 
quite horrible. <laughs> um, funny story, or not funny story, milk, milkshake's pretty much the last story of mine that my wife ever <laughs> read because she found it so disturbing uh, that she wasn't sure that she wanted to read anything else. Um, but, but I don't think that, you know, they're not, it's a shame because they're not really, uh, you know, they're not an average of the kind of thing I write. They're just one, one aspect. But um, it's nice to have, I think there's that little bit of, uh, of what would you call it, extreme horror, splatterpunk kind of vibe uh, to, to spice things up. It's, it's quite a nice thing. Although I hadn't quite, I'd forgot to, I mean, I knew that those, those were really, you know, they're fairly horrible. I mean, they're fun. I think they're fun. They're not that kind of like, to me, um, they're a much darker, more disturbing stories. And those are, are, are more um, like a sort of horror roller coaster, I suppose. You know, they're kind of, it's hor horrific, but you, you should enjoy, <laughs> you should have fun with it, I guess. Um, but I'd kind of forgotten that Teppanyaki of Truth also seemed to uh, provoke similar reactions because I'd gotten so used to it that I kind of wasn't even thinking about it as being in that area. I want to talk about time. I want to cast your mind back to um, the time just before my Dead and Blackened Heart is released. So we've done all the work, you've collected all the stories up, you've gone through and done any edits on it you need to, the order's been set, the cover's made. The proofs have been done. You've seen it. It's about to come out. Uh, so just on the verge of release, how are you feeling? Nervous, I think. So I was surprised, actually, because I, you know, as I'm as, as capable of um, uh, feeling, you know, every I think most writers feel some kind of uh, imposter syndrome at some point because you're putting yourself out there. Um, and it, it's it's quite exposing, I suppose. You know, here look at here is what I've done, and it can be quite personal. Uh, and usually, I'm quite oblivious to that kind of thing. I'm kind of too old and beardy to be that sensitive. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, but at, certainly, I was slightly my nerves were definitely slightly on edge as, as that moment approached. How did you launch this one? Um, we did a launch at uh, the British Fantasy Con event in sunny Glasgow. And how did that go? What was the reaction there? Yeah, quite good. It went quite well, I thought. Um, there were a few things going on at the same time, unfortunately, but it was well attended and people bought books and uh, it, it went well, yeah. We had uh, the mighty Jim from uh, Ginger Nuts. Um, I'm not sure what he was doing. He was officiating, and he was—I think—he was definitely there, sitting with us. Uh, and he's, you know, a big supporter of, of of my writing, and I think a big supporter of Sinister. Um, yeah. It was a joint launch, wasn't it? It was for your book and Lex H. Jones's *The Old One in the Sea*. And though Lex couldn't attend, uh, Jim was 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 there on his behalf because he'd written the introduction. For that, that makes book. sense. That makes sense. In my in my mind, Lex was there. <laughs> shows what kind of state my mind's in now i thought yeah you're right okay so uh so the book is the book is out you're feeling nervous you do the launch party the launch goes okay people got the book they're getting the book they're reading the book what was the reaction from readers and how did you feel about it uh the reaction was really was really good um Gin, I mentioned Ginger Nuts, they did two reviews, including a really, well, two actually really specific kind of detailed reviews, which were really, really positive. Um, so that was really nice feeling and, and a great relief. Um, various other reviews started coming out and they were all, all very positive. Some uh, reviews by writers that I admire that, that also review came out and they were very positive. So yeah, it was great, a re really good reaction. Um, friends that had bought it and were sort of not necessarily horror people, uh, not necessarily short story people, but thought they'd make the effort also really enjoyed it and kind of, you know, someone even said it reignited their interest in, in reading short stories. So it was generally 
a very very positive uh, positive thing. And what stories in particular uh, provoked reactions that you were interested in or surprised about? And what were those reactions? Um, ooh, let me think. Well, meat, sweets and uh, milkshake always kind of people shaking their head <laughs> and uh, looking at me with disgust. But like I say, quite enjoying the, the roller coaster ride. Um, one reviewer did actually compare uh, Charlie's turn to to Saki, which, like I've said before, was is far too complimentary for me to admit that that's the case. But that was the kind of vibe that I felt was going there, and and was a story that hadn't been published before, and I wasn't, I, I felt really good about, and so it was nice to have someone uh, get that, you know, get where I was coming from with that. Um, some of the some of the stories that lean more towards a sort of gentle weird got really nice reactions from from uh, from people like Tracy Fahey and Priya Sharma, both of whom are just fantastic writers. So that was that was good. Uh, Jim McLeod had no, said he'd never realised how scary owls were. So that was, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that that. that those are the ones that come to mind initially. <laughs> okay, so that's a, that's a reaction from the stories in the book. Was there any stories that didn't make the cut that you kind of that you were kind of proud of and thought, oh, that you know they were close to making the cut? And and what were those stories? Um, the um, there were a few that, that were close, but I didn't really mind mind them not not getting in there. There was a, a, a sort of zombie prison breakout story which I wrote ages ago, which was kind of more in the uh, kind of action adventure realm, um, which I liked, but felt like a bit felt like too much for this. Um, I, there actually there were a couple of zombie stories that didn't make it that I do really like. Uh, that the uh, lockdown, uh, not lockdown, <laughs> obsessed with lockdown. Um, I can't try to think. Well, I can't think what the titles were, but the uh, the title of the prison one was. But that one's actually been published before. Um, there was one about two old alcoholics in a lockdown that that I quite liked. That uh, could, which involves uh, one of them being chased by zombies on his mobility wagon. <laughs> Church is a darker story than it sounds, but it, I quite like that one, and that didn't that didn't really make the cut because um, I don't didn't want to do a zombie you know a, a undead anthology, just to, wanted to touch on it. Um, oh, there's a couple of, of of dark little things that that could have been in there, but uh, just weren't right for the balance. There's nothing that really leaps out that I wish had been in. There are a couple of things that maybe I'd, I'd include in, in future, in a future collection. Uh, which is your favourite story in the collection? <laughs> That's really difficult. Um, gosh, I, I... That's a really hard question to answer. Um, you know, I've always liked The Last Patrol. Uh, that's the definitely. Yeah. yeah. Explain your inspiration behind the Last Patrol because that is <laughs> definitely the weirdest story in the book, and one of the weirdest stories I've read, to be frank. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I couldn't tell you what, where the, where the heck that came from. Um, I mean, for those that haven't read it, it's basically a clown story. Um, one Was clown. That I think that's what you said to me at the time because it first appeared in the Sinister Annual, didn't it? And uh, I seem to remember reading it and I turned around and asked you, I said, the hell were you thinking? And you went, I just wanted to write a story about clowns. <laughs> I think that was probably it. Yeah, I, I wanted to write a clown story. Um, the clowns are uh, basically a Vietnam vet, um, a, a surgeon who did terrible things. And a, and a runaway kid. Um, I got it into my head that the, certainly for the Vietnam vet, the, the somewhere, some reason in my mind, the um, camouflage makeup that, that one might wear in jungle warfare 
got intermingled with the clown makeup in my mind. And I think perhaps that's where I really, that's what, what I ran with. Because uh, their clown car is a painted up old Jeep. It's still got the bullet holes in it. Um, and they, they, they kind of are almost having, having flashbacks to their former lives as they go out and do their thing in the arena. Uh, it is a strange one. But that's why I like it, I think. <laughs> and that's why it probably ranks as one of your, one of your favourites, if not your favourite. It's uh, one of my favourites, I think. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, you know, I like different ones for different reasons, I think. Um, I, I quite like Nose to the Window, which is really a very peaceful one. Um, it's dark, it's a little bit weird, but, there's, but there's, it's not very visceral at all. Um, but I think I just like the atmosphere of that. It has, it's dark. I like, a, I like the gentle dark twist of that. Um, at the same time, I quite like the sort of in your faceness of, uh, of, of the Tepanyaki of Truth. Um, or Meat Sweets, perhaps. Well, I wouldn't never call them my, my favourites, I don't think, but they're, they're, they're amongst the most fun ones for me. Am I right in saying something akin to Despair, the opener? Didn't that win a, a competition or something? It was a sort of a member of a, a space opera, a space opera writers group. Even though I'd never written space opera, but uh, it interested me. I had friends who, who, you know, that was kind of their sole focus, um, and they would have a flash fiction competition a um, couple of times a year or once a year. And I thought, well, why not? <laughs> Uh, so I wrote that, and yeah, it won to my surprise, and probably their disgust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you say there's anything in the collection that um, has, has been overlooked? I know sometimes people, uh, or, you know, authors might write something into books, uh, and then that can be kind of missed. Maybe it's buried a bit deep, or you didn't think it was going to be as hidden as it was. Is there anything within? Uh, my dead and black and heart and the stories within that people overlook. You think? Uh, you mean in terms of stories that that didn't get a mention, or? Yeah, stories that didn't get a mention, or anything in the stories that kind of seem to pass people by. Um, I can't think of anything specifically. Not really. Not 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 thematically. Um, I kind of. I'd like my, the little ending story beyond the book to get more me, more, more love. <laughs> it's just a small but, uh, to my mind, perfectly formed ghost story, actually. Probably the only, I know it's not the only ghost story, but, but a rare ghost story from me. Um, the ghost story centred around social media as well. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to me, it had that sort of sci-fi element of kind of taking an idea and extrapolating it out a bit forward into the future and going, right, social media is a relatively new thing now, but this is what is going to, this is what can happen with it. In it's a, yeah, and, and, but on a sort of a futuristic personal level in that it's what will befall all of us at some point, <laughs> possibly, whoever. It's, like, it's a sort of last man standing type scenario. And is there anything um, you would say that you are most proud of with this with this book? Um, I, I, I'm proud. I'm proud of it as a whole. I, I'm proud of it as a whole. I think um, I'm just. It's great to see uh, all the stories together. I'm quite happy with with all of them. I can dip into it and feel good about it. Uh, I'm proud of my son's artwork and the way it looks um, and I'm really pleased with the way that that Sinister and yourself helped me put it together so I think I just, I'm just overall quite proud of it I think it's quite a, a lovely little horrible thing I think I owe a lot of people thanks I think the uh, I owe the, the the friendship and encouragement of the of the horror community at large you know for just being such such a, a a good community to be to be a part of and to encourage one to get on and do and do stuff and to be a part of various projects and um 
you know, without making it sound like the Oscars, I, I should thank the reviewers and Sinister and <laughs> and my family for putting up with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really just that, you know, just it's not a, it, there's a, it's a, it's not come out of a vacuum, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, and that's interesting. You talk about the community um, uh, and that kind of, that sort of encouragement. I mean, is that something that you think if the community didn't exist you wouldn't have come to this conclusion and having a book out and how did they kind of encourage you um i think they well partly they encouraged me by um by give, by being positive about my work i think uh partly they encouraged me by working so blooming hard themselves that they make me look bad so i need to get off my rear and <laughs> get on with some work um <laughs> Where if they if the community didn't exist, I don't know. It's a strange thing because it, like I said, really early on in the interview, I had no idea that this sort of indie publishing thing existed, and I had no idea that things like Fancy Con or Edge Lit existed. So it was kind of hadn't occurred to me that they might. You know, I was a, a, a writing bits and pieces for myself. Uh, you know, when I, when I was involved with the music thing, I wrote a few articles and reviews for music magazines just because I could. Um, so I, I don't know what, what I'd have ended up doing. I think I probably would. I would have done something, uh, but quite what I don't know. It, might, it would have, uh, it's really hard to say because it would have been a, a totally different world. <laughs> Looking towards the future, uh, do you have any projects on the go? Is there going to be another collection maybe? Or are you doing some short stories now or working on any longer fiction? Um, I'm, uh, as usual, working on a, a lot of bits and pieces and seeing what, what kind of sticks and what, what I end up focusing on. I definitely would like, I'd like to do another collection and not leave it too long. Um, and I have got some finished stories and some underway uh, I'd like to do some longer some longer things possibly just novella length at, the, at this point although uh, you know for me it's really what 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 takes life as I'm writing it um, it's not been the most creative year necessarily I mean I've got I've done stuff but you know the, the uh, whole pandemic thing has kind of reduced my, my enthusiasm a bit. Um, and, and why is that? I mean, if it's not too personal to ask. I don't know, really. I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't really put my finger on it. It's just been a very sort of unfocused and doubtful time, I suppose. And, you know, and the reality of uh, um, uh, life being very different in terms of uh, not being able to you know, go anywhere and interact with with the with the people in in the in the in the whole writing community. I guess I don't know. I, I'm probably just making excuses, but I, it just has, it just hasn't seemed like uh, a very inspiring time to me. Mm. Well, you talked about the fact that the community kind of inspired you to do the writing, um, you know, and to and to to get off your rear and do more <laughs> and. You know, since since uh, the pandemic came along and all the restrictions for the travel and meeting up, etc., came into place, there hasn't been any conventions. So the community has only really been online. So have you found that been a been a factor in that kind of lack of motivation that you you're not seeing those people anymore? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think it's it's it. I think it contributes because it's always great to go to. Uh, you know, one of the events and 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 get fired up. Um, I would like to say that you know I'm that I totally blame the lack of that for anything, but that's certainly uh, uh, something that puts a, a fire under you. You know, you go away and you see what everyone else has been doing, and you come back and you've got extra energy for stuff. So, although it's not been a very productive uh, sort of time uh, within the kind of age of the plague as it were um what is the last thing that you have been working on can you give us a sneak preview actually i, I mentioned the um 
Danny, Sarah, Sarah, sorry, Danny, I'm saying your name wrong. I know he's Italian and I'm pronouncing it wrong. I mentioned the painting by him that I, that I have on my wall and I've been working away at a novella that, that is inspired by that somehow uh, for quite a while. So that's something I've been working on recently. That's, uh, can can you give us any hints as to what that novella might be about? Um, it's set in Paris uh just before the world fair of um i can't think of the exact year but the late 19th century where the the world fair for which they built the eiffel tower so actually the main character in it is is a builder on the eiffel tower and uh he finds a, a wounded girl at the base of the tower one day and it's without giving too much away what where did she come from what's what's her story and what's his story why why has she turned up in his life ah interesting well thank thank you very much that does sound like we'll keep an eye out for that so uh, andy i just want to say uh, thank you ever so much for taking that little trip down memory lane and uh, giving us all the gory details on your short story collection my dead in black and heart andy thank you very much thank you for having me it's been a pleasure i hope uh, i hope it was interesting <laughs> my dead and blackened heart by andrew freudenberg is available on paperback and kindle and hardback the kindle can be purchased from amazon the paperback and hardback can be found through most retailers including waterstones barnes and noble amazon and directly via the sinister horror company at the website sinisterhorrorcompany.com Thank you for listening. Being an independent publisher, we are just like you. We share the same passion, the same love for horror fiction. We believe in the incredible work being created, unnoticed by the mainstream. And we want to share it with the world. We are the Sinister Horror Company.